My name is Laura Chenewich. I'm the director for the Centre for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. And I'm part of the bigger raw for d project. The research project is looking at the intersection between MOOCs, educator motives in making MOOCs, open education resources and open education practices, which is quite a complex set of intersections. The research question specifically looks at MOOC making and OER, open education resource adoption, and the influence on open education practices. So the methodology is largely qualitative. We had um, six educators and four MOOCs and we were able to interview those educators before the MOOCs were made, directly after the MOOCs were made and then six to ten months later. We were also able to draw on other artefacts such as the MOOC promotional videos, the proposals that were used to tender for the MOOCs, focus groups, additional interviews with assistants and research assistants and mentors on the projects and uh, other such uh, artefacts. And we used InVivo, which is software for qualitative research to do analysis. These were theme-based analyses coding for uh, codes around open education practices. Because this is quite a complex project, I will need to divide up the findings into the types of questions that we ask. So we looked particularly at three types of open education practices, although we are very mindful that the literature shows there's a much wider range of open educational practices. We looked particularly at legal openness, pedagogical openness and financial openness. And we found, and particularly how those intersected with open education resources, we found in the case of legal openness that the legal openness was an enabler for other types of open ed educational practices. The educators were generally in favour of legal openness, although they were not committed to implementing the, the specific kinds of things that you need to implement legal openness. They were very happy for someone else to undertake those kinds of legal openness. And that provided a foundation for pedagogical openness. And there were different types of pedagog pedagogical openness. I'm thinking here of pedagogical strategies that are needed for open audiences, very diverse open audiences, non-traditional audiences out of, obviously MOOCs are non-formal, uh, they're non-formal and they're non-credit bearing. So these types of pedagogical strategies include uh, communicative strategies needed for diverse audiences and assessment strategies which would be quite different from the traditional assessment strategies. The one that was the most interesting and perhaps unexpected was the finding about financial openness, financial open education practices, where in the case of one particular educator, the issue of affordability and financial openness and what does free and open actually mean became a critical issue. And this particular educator in this particular MOOC was committed to considering financial models and new business models which would maximize access. And this really meant interrogating how maximum affordability would be possible through financial aid, through cross-subsidization, cross etc. And what this leads to is the possibility of making more MOOCs and thus increasing and broadening access to open education and to higher education in general. I think the research has a number of possible outcomes. The first thing that will be very useful from the research is the understanding of copyright and legal openness, which comes back to the designers of the MOOCs and the learning designers in particular. 
the fact that it's unlikely that educators are going to want to take on that, that uh, kind of work themselves and the implications of that for making MOOCs in future for the division of labor and for the work. The consequences and implications of financial openness are incredibly challenging but also very exciting in terms of pushing the boundaries of new business models which is something I think we're very excited about in terms of impact and the implications for policy makers that come out of this research are also particularly relevant. I think what's happened traditionally and in the research literature to date is that open education resources and the legal nature of OERs get privileged. What's very interesting in this work is that in fact we have found that OEP is what leads more likely to interest and engagement with OER. So it's a kind of a flipping of the assumptions and it's, it's pushing the boundaries of what we understand the role of OEP to be.